as promised, uh, I said that we'd have some more footage, right, on flips. And uh, with without further ado, I've got a a flip master <laughs> right here in our presence. Can you believe that? Oh boy, that? that's a lot of pressure. Um, and I just pepper her all the time with questions about what she's doing with some of her latest projects. And so, yeah, we wanted to tackle a few different topics right. when we're talking about flips. So if you're okay with that, yeah, let's do we it. want all of your secrets though. Okay. We don't want you to hold back. <laughs> Don't, you know, keep any, don't have any secrets all right, this for is this the crowd, time. all right? I'll give all my secrets. Even though somebody might copy you, that's okay. Yeah. You're putting it out in the world. Okay, so the first question that I think a lot of people have are, um, like, what makes sense to you as far as dollars and cents goes? You don't take on every project, right? right? So how do you, do you have any um, formulas, any, like, Excel documents that you're playing around with to say, okay, this is a, a wise investment. I should move forward with this flip. Or or how do you go about determining what projects you take and what projects you don't? If that makes any sense. Sure, that makes sense. So I don't have an exact formula. I do use a um, estimated net proceeds uh, sheet or like calculation uh, pretty often, but mostly, it comes down to a lot of different factors. So if it's a pretty small project or a quick project, yeah. so maybe something that'll flip in 30 days, um, I would be more willing to take a smaller profit as opposed to something that might take 75 days to flip or at a higher price point. Um, that's a riskier uh, that's a riskier investment. So I would have to see more margin in that. So to get really specific, I'm probably looking on a low end for risk of a $30,000 profit okay. and for a higher end of the risk um, I would be looking at $45,000 plus in profit okay. and that's just because of the time factor and how many times am I going to go to the house and you know what else plays a big role in that too is flipping isn't my uh, job you know right. it's something I do on the side right so if the property is 30 minutes from my house I have to calculate what kind of time that's gonna take me yeah if it were five minutes from my house I might be willing to take a little bit lower profit because it's just an easier project right so uh, you know in a perfect world mm -hmm. in a perfect world how often are you going over to your flip um, in a perfect world or yeah. like a reality? Yeah, well, I mean, no, I mean, in a perfect world, how, how often would you like, do you want to be over there every day? Do you no. want to be over there once a week, twice a week, once, would... once every two weeks? Like what, like what do you feel like is the appropriate amount of like oversight? Cause you're the, you are the money, you're the brains, you are, you're also the boss lady. Like mm -hmm. you are, you are kind of all everything, but we right. know that's not how it always works. Right. So how, how often do you want to be over at your projects? So if I am kind of hands off or I have a general contractor who's taking care of everything but I'm just making design uh, decisions, then I'm over there maybe like once a week. Right. If I'm over there and I'm the one like picking up materials and I am uh, needing to coordinate contractors, then I mean it could be two, three, four, five, six, yeah, seven times multiple a week. times a day. Right. I mean, ideally, it'd be great if you only had to go once a week, but yeah, that's not that's not super typical, and it depends on like what stage you are in in right. the flipping process. Okay. You know, especially toward the end, uh, I'm there pr pretty much every day, making sure everything's ready to go for a listing. Right. Uh, if you didn't catch it, I want to point out that this beautiful woman said she's actually picking up and delivering some of the materials. <laughs> I've been there for that, okay? so Yeah, not in this outfit, but... Yeah, not just the pretty face, okay? <laughs> uh, speaking of pretty, okay, design choices. Yes. Um, I know in Stilicum, you knocked it out of the park. You use a lot of blacks, a lot of whites, grays. Mm -hmm. Like, where are you getting your design choices from? Are they all in your head? Are you looking at magazines? Are you watching HGTV? Like, how do you go about saying, okay, we're gonna use this tile, we're gonna use this countertop, we're gonna use these colors. Like, how, how does that project right. happen? Well, I would say that most of my inspiration comes from things that I've seen in other homes. I mean, you know how often we're inside other people's houses. Yeah. So it's really fun to see different choices that people make and then kind of take that and, and uh, 
make your own choices with it. So basically I design the houses to be what I would want to live in. Yeah. I've been in so many flipped houses. I can testify to that. <laughs> <laughs> True. Um, but I've been in so many flipped houses where you walk in and everything's exactly the same. It's like the same tile and the same backsplash and the right. same flooring and the same carpet and the same everything. And so just by switching it up a little bit and putting in some custom pieces or some unique tile that maybe won't even cost that much more than the typical tile that everybody uses, it goes a long way and makes such a difference. So I'm really trying to make the house stand out and catch like the right buyers yeah. attention you know yeah. so it feels like home and it feels exciting for those buyers when they're uh, looking at the house yeah um, as far as where where else I would get my inspiration from is probably just like going into the different uh, wholesale material places or even Home Depot or just looking at the magazines I don't watch a whole lot of HGTV sometimes I'll catch it when I'm on vacation but yeah. Um, that's mainly where I get the ideas from. Okay, cool. All right, so final question, um, and this has to do with like inspection items mm -hmm. kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. You, um, part of the process, right, is you, you buy a house, you flip a house, um, a buyer then does an inspection on the property, and hopefully, you know, it's no, it's no game changers, right? I mean, you're not like, oh right. my gosh, how did I miss this $20,000? Yeah you know, issue. But um, this question pertains specifically to Federal Pacific Electrical Panels. So okay. if you ask any uh, electrician, they're mm -hmm. going to say that this Federal Pacific Panel is unsafe. You should change it immediately. That that type of stuff. I personally own a house mm -hmm. with a Federal Pacific Panel. I've lived there for two and a half years. I've had zero issues. Okay. So, but let's, from the investor standpoint, all right, when you are looking at a project and it has a Federal Pacific panel, right. are you like, hey, no brainer, I'm changing that? Mm -hmm. Or are you saying, no, I'm gonna keep it the way it is? Yeah. Or are you saying, hey, we'll, we'll see what happens during the inspection process? Like, what is your strategy specifically with a Federal Pacific panel or other kind of items mm -hmm. like that? Right, well, I think one of the perks to being a realtor and an investor is that we see all the time the things that the inspectors call out. Yeah. So like Federal Pacific panels are always going to be called out and yeah. the buyers are always going to be concerned about them. So I actually have an inspection done on the house before, by a license, by a license okay. inspector before I even purchase it. Um, not necessarily contingent on the inspection, but just so I know what I'm getting into and what needs to be fixed because my goal is that during um, the the new buyer's uh, inspection, they're not gonna find many issues. Right. If anything, it might be small little things that need to get tied up, but my goal is to try to take care of all of those things before the inspection even happens. Okay. So, Federal Pacific Panel, if I see that going into it, like I'm already, um, calculating about a $2,500 cost and I'm and I'm putting that in my numbers and anything else like that too so okay. um, yeah but I'm getting a full-blown inspection done and I'm taking care of, like those are the main items even before I get to the cosmetic expenses. right so from a buyer standpoint mm -hmm. if you're a buyer mm -hmm. right uh, if you know an inspection has already been taken place from this inspector as a buyer you already know the seller knows right. if they haven't addressed X, Y, and Z, mm -hmm. that it's probably coming. Right. Right? Exactly. So when I'm representing a buyer on a flip, I'm always counseling my folks to be aggressive on that inspection. Let's say um, let's say there's a, a, a pipe leaking or the, the, the drain from the shower is leaking, okay? Mm -hmm. And all those all those um, materials are new and there's a leak. That that flipper didn't hire that contractor to install that and there be a drip. Mm -hmm. So when you ask for that to be done, it's not gonna cost that investor or that flipper any money to repair that because he's gonna tell the contractor, hey, you messed up on this, go yeah. fix your work. So it's so I think it's always better to be aggressive, mm -hmm. right, when you're a buyer buying a flip because they already know what's coming, one, right. and two, they've already got the hookups for a quick speedy yeah. fix. 
I mean, that is the nice thing about being an investor is that you have your contractors typically already lined up. And if in a perfect world. In a perfect world. And um, if somebody did make a mistake along the way, then yeah, they would need to go fix it. Now, if yeah. it were something that just like the inspector didn't catch and the contractor didn't catch and the owner didn't catch, like that's a whole nother ordeal. But typically the inspector is very good at like finding all of those uh, main issues that could be issues and then for me as an investor I I want to have all of those taken care of yeah. before I even put the house back on the market so. yeah okay we're wrapping up uh, as you can tell on December 1st <laughs> I will have officially outdone myself <laughs> okay if you don't know Jess and I are getting married mm -hmm. on December 1st I don't know how I did it all praise goes out <laughs> To you know who and uh, yeah we will continue with these videos I hope they're helping um, there are so many flipped properties out there, there I mean I would say I don't know what the percentages is but there yeah. are all kinds of flip properties out there uh, and we want you to know what you're getting yourself into sure. from from every standpoint and I will just say this I think Jess might allude to this but every flipped property is different Oh, every sure. single one yeah. if it's a property that just flipped you can be you can be sure it's gonna be a quality product or she's never even gonna get involved right. but there are other ends of the spectrum too where you probably just want to run as far as you can <laughs> from that property so you want to close up yeah I mean uh, drop us some questions yeah we'd love your like, questions for if, sure if you're interested in uh, getting involved with investment properties or flipping or if you're a buyer just maybe have some questions on what to look for in a flip property, leave us some comments and questions and we'd love to follow up and answer them in more videos or we'll just uh, write you back. Sounds good. All right, guys, take care. We'll talk to you later.